Hey guys, welcome to She Knows Arsenal. My name is Jessica and I'm your host and you can follow me on Twitter at Itch Jessino. On today's show, well, I'm kind of introducing a newest show. I've been kind of playing around with this a little bit. I wanted to do something a little bit different when we talk about transfers. And so basically it's called the happy hour show. Let's just say that. And you're probably like, well, you live in California, it's 10 a.m. Don't worry about that. In the UK, it's like 6 p.m. So just go with that. And so what I kind of want to do is talk about transfers, but then also do some trivia and some fun things in between just to kind of break it up so it's not so intense. Transfer season for Arsenal fans is always very, very intense. Everybody's on edge. So let's just break that up a little bit and talk about the transfers, but also have fun at the same time. And so I have gathered a nice panel for today's show. And so I'll go ahead and introduce them now. I have Laura Kirk here. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hey, Jess, I'm good. It is indeed happy hour here in London. So I don't have a drink, but it is it is appropriate to drink here. Not that it's not 10 a.m., but, you know, we're, we're ready to go. Oh, my gosh. Give me one second. It always happens <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm in the office. And then so I also have Kaya here from Football London. Hey, Kaya, how are you? Hi. Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I've got a, a stiff water with me for happy hour. So I love it. Really, I love really, it. Really so we're not going to force anybody to drink. I'm not going to be like, okay, if you got the question <laughs> wrong, you have to like drink or whatever. But if you have a drink and you're just relaxing, watching the Euros, taking a little break, watching us and watching the Euros at the same time, do you? But ultimately, we're just going to have fun and just have a lighthearted transfer conversation because every single day it gets so intense around here. And I, I just I can't do it today. I can't do it. And I, I think one of the things that I don't really understand is how we're always kind of like Arsenal spend some money, Arsenal act quickly, Arsenal do this. And then it kind of feels like we're doing that, but fans are still very intense. You know, Kaya, have you kind of felt that on your end a little bit? Yeah, um, with all the transfer stuff, especially over the past couple of days, it's been pretty mad. I mean, I saw someone on Twitter tell her, I say, you know, Arsenal need to know tomorrow's not transfer deadline day. They don't need to do all of this now. But I guess it's a good sign. Maybe it's something to do with the Premier League fixture announcement. We saw Arsenal have a really tough start coming up. I think they've got City, Chelsea and Spurs within the first six games. So maybe that sort of sped them up a bit and they thought, right, we need to get this done. We need to get all the stuff, all our deals done nice and early so that we've got a good squad, a good pre-season. And yeah, I guess that's why people are feeling pretty intense right now. Yeah, for sure. Laura, did you get a chance to look at our first couple of fixtures? Yeah, I did. I, I'm Obviously, it's, it's a tough start for us. I also don't know how I feel about Brentford on the first day. I think, yeah. you know, any team that's just come up, they're going to be absolutely buzzing. They're in a new stadium. I think if we go there with any kind of complacency, we are going to get beaten. And, and I, I, I'm more concerned about that than I think look, we know where we are with the big sides, but that is one way you're thinking points. That is a genuine sort of concern. So it's a super tough start for Arsenal, like super, super tough. Yeah, for sure. And watching Brentford, they're definitely a different kettle of fish than Fulham, you know, when we played them on the very first day of the season. I think 
Brentford can play a little bit. I think Fulham started off with a, a pretty poor team, and we saw when we come, came up against them later on in the season, we couldn't even beat them. So we definitely need to be on point, and I would expect us to get – you know, at least at least nine points from our first five ish games. Um, I'm actually for this season, not really super stressed out about the Man City games or the Chelsea games, because realistically, based on how they spend and how we spend, we shouldn't actually be beating them that I think the pressure is more on them to make sure that they beat us. But for us to get into the top five, six, whatever, we actually need to be beating the smaller teams. I mean, that's kind of my expectation. Laura, do you have like a similar expect? Oh, actually, you're sorting out your internet, aren't you? Yeah, okay. give me two seconds. <laughs> yeah. I'll think about it. <laughs> Kaya, what are your expectations in terms of, you know, what do you want to see next season? Not necessarily from like a, a a point standpoint or like a result standpoint, but just like, do you expect us to be beating the small teams? Do you expect a certain type of formation? You know, those types of things. Yeah, I think interestingly under Arteta, Arsenal's record against the big side has actually been pretty decent. I think that was always a problem under... Arsene Wenger in the latter years at least and under Unai Emery as well whereas recently he's been quite, pretty good sorry at getting results against the big teams it's been against the smaller teams where Arsenal have struggled maybe with teams sit back and defend a bit more that's when Arsenal tend to struggle to break players down which is why we're seeing Arsenal link with so many creative players in this transfer window because that's the kind of player they need to break down these tight deep packed defences so I think maybe that's what Arsenal need to focus on is trying to pick up the points they should be picking up and then in terms of formation I think it could be I don't want to say it too early because I'm just sort of, this is just a hunch and I'm not basing this on any real insider info or anything like that but I've just got a sneaky suspicion with the transfers Arsenal have been linked to and we'll come on to them a bit later but maybe Arteta is thinking of moving Arsenal from the 4-2-3-1 to a 4-3-3 we saw him say back in December last year I think it was that that's his aim with Arsenal to, to move them into a more attacking 4-3-3 one day so maybe He's decided, right, last year I didn't get what I want. This year I'm going to the transfer market. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to have the team playing the way I want. Maybe that's what I'm expecting next season. I mean, they they have to back him. I think that's what they have to do. You don't keep Arteta in the job and then don't give him the money and the players that he needs to, to kind of get this project going. You know, so Laura, last time we spoke, I... I'm pretty sure we are in the middle of meltdown. We may have just gotten kicked out of the Europa League or something crazy like that. So now that the dust is kind of settled and you're looking towards next season, what are your expectations for next season? Not just from like a, you know, fourth through fifth place, but what do you want to see on the pitch next season for Arsenal? All right. Well, give me a shout if my microphone's broken up again. Just give me a little wave. You're the thing right. I... The thing I really do not want to see again, which just tortured us last year, is consistent no shots on target, uh, you know, throughout the whole game. If that happens again, and I do agree, we've got to back Arteta, that cannot happen. We are not the type of side to play that kind of football. So what I want to see is attacking football, creativity, chances. And that, I think, is how we are. And I totally agree. I'm not expecting us to go and beat Man City. I'm not expecting us to beat you know, even though we do have a good record on Arteta, the way that we're going to break down the sides that we need to be is being more attacking. So in that first, you know, run up to Christmas, I just want to see some more shots on target, a bit more creativity. And I think that for me would be progress on last season because watching some of those games that, um, you know, last year where we should have won against teams we think we should be beating to register, you know, no shots on targets, very little chances created, that would be a huge failure for me for next season in terms of progress, for sure. 100%. And when we get on to some of the players, we'll kind of talk about how they can help us achieve some of those goals on the pitch. But before we do that, let's start. Who knows Arsenal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like I said earlier today, um, we're going to be doing a little bit of trivia just to break up you know, the monotony of just talking about transfers. So this is the first the first round. you know. So let's see what you guys got. You know, Laura versus mm -hmm. Kaya. Here we go. So, which of the following Arsenal goalkeepers conceded the least goals? Almunia, Peter Cech, Wojciech Chesney, or David Seaman? Whoever answers you, first wins. Oh, you know, uh, oh, right. Whoever answers right wins. <laughs> I'm guessing Chesney just because maybe he played less games than the others. I was, I was thinking because Seaman obviously it was brilliant for us, but played so much. Yeah. 
And then it so can be going... Czech as well, because he was only around for a few years. <laughs> it's a really hard question to start with, Jess. Oh my God, <laughs> Jess, I thought these were going to be super easy. Yeah. Um, oh. I'm going to stick with, stick with Chesney, I think. I'm going to go Czech for the same reason, because he wasn't around that long. Okay. Okay. Let's see if you guys got it right. Oh, it's wow. Armenia. What? <laughs> Really? Yeah. I do not have good memories of Almunia. Maybe I'm selectively yeah. too harsh on him. Wow, okay. Wow. Yeah, he's one of the worst goalkeepers that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> like, personal I love that Jess is straight in there. Like, <laughs> you're putting no punches today. He's the worst goalkeeper I've ever seen. Cool. So, when I saw that answer, I was like, are you serious? But I think some of it has to do with the fact that he was, he didn't, I don't think he played that much for us. And he played in a different era with Arsenal where I think we were a little bit better than maybe we thought, but yeah, that was the first one. I was like, that's a shocker, you know? And then just seeing that list of goalkeepers, I'm like, you know, when we get onto goalkeepers in a little bit, I do think we need to look at that area of the pitch and maybe improve a little bit. Like goalkeeper may seem like a, you know, an afterthought, but goalkeepers make a big, make big difference, especially when you're looking at Chesney and Almunia, like, yeah, we need a good goalkeeper. So, but yeah, let's move forward. So, Kaya, tell, tell us a little bit about the Ben White deal and what's going on with that at the moment. Yeah, so Arsenal submitted this week a bid of £40 million for Ben White, uh, the Brighton defender. He's an England international. He's away with them at the Euros right now. And they're going back in again. They want him. They're, they're trying to get that deal done quite quickly because there's plenty of interest in him from not just Arsenal, but other big teams in the Premier League. I think Liverpool and Manchester United are among the teams interested in him. So... Also going back in, uh, we reported at Football London today that the second bid is going to be in the region of around 45 million. But I think Brighton are holding out for 50 million, maybe even more, which is it's a lot. Uh, maybe we can discuss a bit about what sort of the merits are of making such an expensive signing. But I think Arsenal are hopeful of getting a compromise in between the 45 and 50 million mark, maybe some add-ons involved or something like that. But Brighton are pretty tough negotiators. They've shown in the past that they're not going to be bullied in the transfer market by bigger teams. So I can't see Arsenal maybe bringing Brighton down from 50 million if that's the asking price they've set. Brighton have got no real incentive to, to lower their asking price. So, yeah, um, that's the current state of play right now. Arsenal are very interested in Ben White and they're, they're going to go back in to try and get him. Mm. I've been trying to make this one make sense since we first got him, <laughs> right? I'm like, that's my whole thing. It's like, let me try to make it make sense because we're looking at, and I, I have to say that I think a lot of the anxiety around Ben White is not really about Ben White, it's about Saliba. Like, I really mm. think it's more that than anything. I think we're overplaying like how bad he is. There's a lot of Arsenal fans that are saying like, he's not good at all, which is, is not true. He's actually, he's a good defender. He's a good player. I think it's just, where does that leave Saliba? And because we're distrustful of the Arsenal board and what they're saying about Saliba, we're thinking that this is a replacement, which I'm not really sure that's 100% true. But Laura, for you, like, what do you think about Ben White? And do you see this making sense in any way, shape or form in terms of what we're trying to do next season? I mean, it's not like our defense was bad but would it actually hurt us to bring in another central defender that's maybe better than a holding and could replace Louise? Yeah, I, th I think you um, you just landed on it there. The reason I don't think it makes sense at the moment, and we, we were talking about it before, Arsenal have been making moves very early in this transfer window, which is refreshing to see from an Arsenal fan point of view that they are trying to do things. But I think the main worry is that they're prioritising areas that I don't think are the main worry. So that's why I think there's concerns about this price tag that, the opportunity cost of going after a player where in an area where I don't think we necessarily need to spend that much money. That's what makes it confusing. The player himself, I, I got to say, I don't know a huge amount of him. I'm happy to put my hands up and say I'm not 100% sure on what he adds that we we don't currently have. I think with David Luiz going and, you know, I know David Luiz kind of divides opinion, but he was a really decent passer of the ball. So I don't know, Kaya, whether you can share anything about whether Ben White can play in that kind of role is, is, is kind of playing out from the back in the way that David Luiz is. But for me, it, it makes sense, but not given the rest of the squad and where I think we actually need to spend the money. So I don't understand quite why this is the first player that they've gone for, where they're going to go back in with a bid and leave the kind of midfield. It feels like we're taking resources away from where we actually need to spend. So it kind of makes sense, but I don't know enough about the player to understand kind of what he really would add. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, just on what Ben White could bring, uh, you mentioned David Luiz leaving. He's sort of, I guess, a kind of like for like replacement for David Luiz mm -hmm. in terms of a player who can bring the ball out of defence and sort of play the ball forward a lot quicker. That's what Arteta needs because I think he wants to get the ball forward as quickly as possible to try and create chances that Arsenal would like to score from. You've spoken about the lack of shots Arsenal have. That's because they move it so slowly. So that's what Arsenal are trying to fix this season and that's what they're trying to sort in the purchase of Ben White. But my sort of issue with that would be Saliba kind of does that. That's what his game is based on. I've, I had the privilege of getting to see him a couple of times for the under-23s last season and what he does is he dribbles out of defence and he plays long balls and that's what he he's really good at. He started off as a number 10 and you can see that in the way he plays. So it doesn't make too much sense from that sort of point of view when you have a player who in Saliba is is raw. He's not. He's, he'll make a lot of mistakes next season. I don't think he's the finished article by any stretch of the imagination. But to spend as much as Arsenal were reportedly going to spend on Ben White does, like you say, seem odd given they've got not that much money this summer. Well, they have money, clearly, but not enough to maybe go out and strengthen the areas. Like you say, I agree, the midfield is an area they really need to focus on. So maybe Ben White will offer something that will be good for Arsenal, but it's not something they need desperately. And I don't think Rob Holding is that bad a defender. I think he gets quite a lot of criticism. He's not the best on the ball um, c compared to a Louise or a Saliba or even a Ben White, but I think he's a decent player and he's a real leader at the back. So I think Arsenal are pretty well stocked in terms of centre backs. I don't really think they need to go out and get another one, but you know, if, if that's if that's what um, if that's what they're deciding to do, then in Arsenal we trust, I guess. I think my thing is I want to be consistent about what I say on here. You know, I, I try to make sure that I'm as consistent as possible and I apply what I think about certain situations in, in multiple scenarios. So I kind of said yesterday that, and we'll get on to James Madison in a minute, that a lot of people are concerned about Emile Smith Rowe and whether or not James Madison will be blocking his path. And I don't actually believe that. I think with your younger players, you need better players to play with and around. And you also need good rotation because I can't see a Mill Smith Rowe playing like 25 to 30 games at a high level and getting the 10 goals and 10 assists that would be necessary for us to get where we need to go. Cause I mean, those are the type of numbers that De Bruyne and your Bruno Fernandez and these types of players are getting. So I think the same can be applied to Saliba as well, even though we view him as a grown man because of maybe his stature and how good he plays in France. But the reality is, you know, the Premier League is completely different. And I know how the fans react to players. Young players are not exempt from the type of scrutiny and criticism that comes from the Arsenal fan base when they make some mistakes. And so if you're telling me that we buy Ben White and Saliba gets to progress at his own pace, they can play in a back three, you know, with Gabrielle, Ben White, and Saliba, or, you know, Saliba just rotates with with Holding and Ben White, then for me, it's kind of like, that's fine. And as a 19-year-old, 19, 20-year-old, should you really be coming into the Arsenal first team, starting every game, playing next to Gabrielle? That's not really, to me, the right type of combination, if we're being realistic. From a resource standpoint and we need Saliba to be happy and we don't want him to leave because he's not starting. Yeah, I can understand that. But like, if we're really thinking about it, there needs to be somebody else that steps in. And if Arteta and Adu don't think that holding can do it, because a lot of people are saying that holding is kind of a low block type of defender. You can't really push up with him, but you can with Ben White. So as I'm trying to make it make sense, I want to be consistent, but that's, all with the idea that Saliba stays at the club. You know, when we hear Newcastle are sniffing around, it's a little worrying, isn't it, Kaya? Yeah, I don't know how much there is in those Newcastle links. I think if Saliba was to go anyway, he'd probably go back to France if it were permanent. What I would just say on that is Arsenal aren't in Europe next season, which is something they really have to factor in with the number of games they're going to be playing. It's possible that, let's say, they go out in the first round of the Carabao Cup and the first round of the FA Cup, then... Saliba could only realistically have a couple of games to play next season, which I agree with you. I don't think he should be thrown in to play week in, week out. But at his age, he's 20 now. He does need to be getting some form of game time, some form of consistent game time, if possible. So with only three competitions to be involved in next season, for me, having five centre-backs seems excessive. I know that Arsenal have a lot of injury issues. Rob Holding has had injury issues in the past. Callum Chambers has had injury issues. 
Pablo Marie was out for a while. Gabriel had his periods out last season. So rotation is needed, and I agree. And I don't think there are, apart from sort of the Saliba and in terms of numbers, I don't think there are that many negatives to bring a player of quality of Ben White. I just worry that Saliba is someone who Arsenal have invested a lot of money in for someone who was only 18 when they bought him. And to not even give him a chance to prove that, it seems strange. And I think to send him out on loan again next season would just not be uh, what's needed. I think now is his time to to come back and hopefully play some games. And I would worry that the signing of Ben White would, would um, potentially stop that, particularly with just three competitions rather than four. I don't think Arteta would survive that that little section no. of time when Saliba's leaving and Ben White's coming in. I don't think he'd survive that. I just think the fan base would capitulate, even though I don't necessarily feel like we would play worse. You know, I just, ugh, you know, I don't even want to see that happening, to be honest. But it looks like Ben White is, is something that we're really going to be doing. So we just have to wait and see. So you guys let us know in the chat box what you think. And we'll move on to round two of who knows Arsenal. <laughs> so far, nobody. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, second question is: Which of the following players players won the Euro, the Euros, as an Arsenal player? Uh, Fabregas. It's only one. Fabregas. Fabregas. Yeah. Oh, players. Fabregas. It's, it's only one. It's only one. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, just Fabregas. Okay, so you guys both said Fabregas. So let's see if you guys got it right. You did. <laughs> Good job, guys. Good job. That one was easier. <laughs> that was easier. All right, that's the tone we're going for. That's that's the level that, that we can, we can operate at. I think. <laughs> good job, good job. So now let's kind of talk about James Madison. I think this one is kind of interesting because for me, is Kaya is he is he frozen? Maybe he's just still thinking about that Fabregas question. <laughs> I was like at first, I was like, is he still thinking? No, he's back. He's back. There he is. <laughs> Are you there, Kaya? <laughs> <laughs> let him sort out his internet but um <laughs> let's talk about James Madison for for a second I just I think this one is a little bit more interesting just because it's a it's a position that I actually think we need to address um good player I don't think we can any of us can say like with the Ben White thing everybody's always oh, not that good we can't really say James Madison is not good we would all we should all be like we would take him right so for you, have you seen enough of, of James Madison to give you enough confidence to say like, okay, yeah, this is a big money signing that we should be looking at? Because a lot of Arsenal fans are kind of like wanting that marquee signing. And I feel like James Madison might be that for us. Yeah, I think I think he could be the player we need. I guess my kind of hesitation is around, and I don't know what the latest on this is around Odegaard. It, you know, is Madison coming in assuming that we don't have Odegaard and he's off yeah. back to Real Madrid? Mm -hmm. In that case... I think it'd be an upgrade and I'd be really happy to have James Madison. I don't know, I guess, assuming that we also get some other players in the midfield to kind of go alongside him, how that would work. But in the past, I think, as you said, Arsenal have made one or two marquee signings per transfer window. What we're not particularly good at is doing a kind of three or four really good solid signings. We seem to, you know, we have Aubameyangs, we have Alexis Sanchez's, but we don't back them up with the right players. So, I think James Madison would be a brilliant signing, but I would also be concerned around who he, who he's playing with. I don't know whether you, you have a kind of thought around who he'd play best with, how that would work. I, I think he'd be brilliant, but I'd be curious about who he's going to be partnered with. Well, I mean, if you think from the perspective of, you know, I don't know about the midfield three thing. I, I don't know. Kaya believes that we'll play like a 4-3-3, but just, you know, if, if you can imagine just James Madison at the 10 and Thomas party in there with maybe a Basuma or somebody like that, I think that's the type of midfield that you need to have in the Premier League to actually compete. We've always kind of had like these one good player, as you've kind of said, like a Sesk, but you know, there's maybe like a Copeland behind him or something like that. Maybe not a Copeland, but yeah. you know, these types of players that are just like not on the same level. And I don't think James Madison would look behind him and see Basuma and Thomas and think, wow, I'm really carrying this midfield. You know, they all have something to bring, you know? So for me, I'm looking at it like this makes sense. Like this makes a lot of sense because he's similar to Odegaard. And for a lot of people, I know they're worried about Smith Rowe. And I don't know if you are, but he's 19, like he'll be okay if there's mm -hmm. a 24, 25 year old playing in front of him. And also these young players need to learn from better players. I mean, 
do you believe that we need to bring in better quality players for Saka and ESR to play with and around and in training with so that they can improve as well? Absolutely. Instead of like a Willian. (laughs) Yeah, like they have carried this team and I don't, I would not kind of, they've had their, their like breakout seasons this season. If they then dip in form the coming up season, that was completely understandable if you don't give them the right support. And I don't think they can continue to operate at the level that they have without the appropriate players behind them. A bit of competition as well. You know, they need to, they need to, you know, show that they are competing for places in a side with the best. So I don't agree that we should worry about a young player if we're adding in quality, because they will learn, they will, you know, they will adapt. And I don't think we can expect to kind of them to operate on the same level for another season if we don't actually give them the right players around them. So I'm not worried about Emma Smith Rowe. I'm worried about him leaving, but I'm not worried about him, how we'd fit in the team. Let's welcome Kaya back. Hey, Kaya. <laughs> welcome Hi. back. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. We're just talking about James Madison, but I do want to kind of just, I'm there's, there's just a couple of comments in here that I want to go to that are good points. You know, Bowie the Cat says, I still don't get why Lester would sell Madison. And for me, looking at the fact that they have moved to this two striker system, you know, they're playing with Vardy and Ian Nacho, they're playing three at the back. It's kind of squeezing Madison out of that entire equation when you play like that, because you have your Tielemans, you're going to play with two other midfielders and he doesn't really fit because he's a 10. He's, he's a natural 10. And that's what we play with. Lester doesn't really play like that anymore. They seem like they're really kind of doubling down on that. So they, if you don't fit the system, it makes sense to go ahead and sell, especially if you can sell high. And if you could get Arsenal to to pay you sixty million for Madison, why wouldn't you do that? There's also been like little rumors about Madison and maybe Brendan Rodgers not getting along. Maybe they've fallen out. You know, Kaya, what do you think about the idea that Lester would not sell Madison to us right now? You know, do you think that that's logical or realistic? I, I think there's something in it. I think Leicester have sort of, when it comes to transfers, uh, plausible deniability is quite a big thing insofar as that if a team says they don't want to sell, it helps them to raise the value. So Leicester will, will always at least publicly say, look, we don't want to sell Madison. He's a key player for us. If we sell him, we're going to have to spend quite a lot of money to replace him. I think what was interesting was that in their FA Cup final win against Chelsea, um, Madison was only a substitute and they were able to do that without him. They were able to win their first ever FA Cup without James Madison being in the squad, which suggests that maybe he's not as crucial a player to them as, as we think. I think that's not because Madison's a bad player. I think like you were saying before, or like the people in the comments were saying, maybe is that it's just because um, tactically he's not really fitting with uh, what Leicester are doing right now. So I think, yeah, Arsenal maybe would see more of a, an accurate tactical fit for a player like James Madison. I think why Leicester would want to sell um, is money. Money always talks in football. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's simple. If Arsenal come forward and put um, 60 million plus on the table, Leicester are going to quite gleefully accept that. I think, well, maybe 70 million plus, but I think they're a team who have always been very smart in the transfer market. If you look at what they did with selling Riyad Mahrez, uh, selling Harry Maguire, they've, they've gone out and replaced them with very good players and signings like Charles Soinger, uh, Yuri Tielemans, Those are kind of players who Leicester are really good at going out and getting. So I don't think they'd be too worried about losing Madison. But at the same time, they would, I think, quite rightfully say, look, if you want him, you're going to have to pay. Yeah, 100%. And this makes a lot more sense to me than Ben White, just because of the fact that we do need a creative midfielder. We need somebody else. And this is a really important point by Yo-Yo. Madison is for Abba's sake. You know, how important is it for us to get somebody who can get our star striker, our main man, back in goal-scoring form. I mean, that has to be a priority, doesn't it, Laura? Yeah, I think one one of the things about Aubameyang in the past like couple of years is that he is, because of the quality of the player he is, he has been able to perform at that level despite everything being set up completely wrong for him. So I think... I would back him to carry on and continuously, um, you know, play at that level. But it would be nice to see him with the sort of support that actually suits how he plays. I think that would unlock certainly the form that we saw maybe early on in his career at Arsenal. If if Madison's that player, then I'm all for it, basically. I think you have to think about the balance in the team and, and that would, 
essentially, as I said, unlock what how Aubameyang actually wants to play and not this kind of like forced um, sort of moving him around the pitch, left, right, all over the place that Arteta has been trying. And I think because Aubameyang is so good, he has kind of covered up how that actually just doesn't really work for his natural game. Um, and he's just been able to kind of still operate at that level. But if Madison's going to be able going to be that person to give him that service then, then I'm all for it I think the price the price tag is insane um <laughs> but that's just I, I do think that's kind of where we are at the moment that you know we can spend all all the time we want moaning about these price tags but I just think that is where we're going to have to get used to these players particularly you know in the Premier League with a premium on that's just what we're gonna have to pay if we want equality and if we're not going to pay it we're going to have to accept that we live in the bottom half of the table and that's that's kind of it so 70 million feels excessive but you know if we want a player of that quality and less to know that we we want him and they don't necessarily need him that's the price tag we're gonna have to pay that's where i kind of sit i'm just like i cannot i just i need people to understand that like you're not going to get a quality player that walks into your team and changes your life without spending the money it just is not it's not realistic. If you want the Bruno Fernandez effect, you have to spend Bruno Fernandez money. And I think Manchester United spent over 60 million with all the add-ons and everything for Bruno Fernandez. And look, I don't think that they're looking back being like, well, that was kind of expensive. They don't care. Like, you know what I mean? So, and I know we have some trauma from be- bringing in <laughs> players for, you know, large fees and them not working out, but James Madison to me is nothing like Pepe. I love Pepe and I think he's a good player, but he was never worth that amount. James Madison may not be $70 million worth, but he's at least worth 50 for what he's going to give you. He's in the starting lineup for Leicester this season, 50% of the time and still was able to produce 10 goals and 11 assists, 10 goals and 11 assists. Think about how different our season would have been if we would have had a player like that. And that's in the starting lineup 50% of the time. So he's a ready-made player that can come in. You can say, why didn't we go after Buendia? He would have cost us 35. He wouldn't have. Because if we had gotten involved, it would have been a bidding war between us and Aston Villa. And they were prepared to go the mile. You know, so we're talking about 40, 40 plus for a player that's coming from the championship. No offense to him, but that's not necessarily a hole in one for me. And then you talk about somebody like Odegaard, who Real Madrid was not going to let leave without us paying at least 40 as well. So for me, it just makes sense to just spend the money on what we know is going to work. You know, I, I, I would have a hard time believing that he comes to Arsenal and just forgets how to play football. Like, you know what I mean? I know we have trauma, but I think it's out of the realm of possibility. So overall, are you guys excited about the the idea of a, a signing like this? You know, matters 10. Yeah. I have some reservations. No. Uh, okay. No, Tell us about your reservations. read. Like, I'm, I'm, you were convincing me away from my reservations. <laughs> Saying all of that, and yeah, that that from uh, side that comment's pretty much it. It's Odegaard or Madison at the minute for Arsenal. For me, I was a huge fan of Martin Odegaard when he came into the team, and yeah, that's more or less what I was going to say. Um, if you can bid seventy million pounds for Madison, I don't think Odegaard would cost sixty five million, but I don't think he'd get the goals and assists, which I think Arsenal definitely need. But I think in terms of um, getting the ball up the pitch, which is something Arsenal really struggled with last season in terms of playing out from the back. When you've got a player like Odegaard in the side who can just carry the ball from A to B really effectively. And I think he's already comfortable. He's already a leader within the dressing room. He already knows what it's like. I think Madison, my my reservations with him is just that he's a player who's great in the final third. But Arsenal's problem has been getting the ball from the defensive third into the final third. So I'm not sure Madison fixes that. Maybe if he was to come with a really uh, ball-progressing central midfielder, then maybe that would be um, a different story. But, I mean, I can't, you can't really cherry-pick when it comes to Arsenal transfer. So that, that's my only reservation, but that's all. So there's a super chat here from Deborah Ducky. Thank you so much for your super chat. He says, I'm assuming a he, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Deborah Ducky. <laughs> sorry, I don't know. I don't know. It's not really giving me any clues. So... A lot of people are saying if we spend 50 plus on Madison, then why don't we go for Grealish? Is that possible? I don't think so. They are not going to sell Jack Grealish for anything less than like 80, you guys. Like I just, it doesn't make sense. Like it really, really doesn't. And I mean, Kaya, maybe you could shed some light on this, but I think the Odegaard slash Madison makes more sense as a why not do the other than spend more to get, spend a little bit more to get Grealish. 
Yeah, I don't like sort of crushing people's dreams with Jack Grealish, <laughs> but unfortunately it's not going to happen. Um, you mentioned 80, I think it'll be closer to 100. Villa have got him on a long-term contract. Um, they've no reason to sell because if they sell him, that's without sounding too disrespectful to Aston Villa, that's their team gone. Without him last season, they really struggled with him in the team. They were pushing for European places. So I don't think Jack Grealish is going to happen. I think if he was to go anywhere, it'd be more like a team like Manchester City with the budget to be able to afford a player like him. 100%. And let me let me just be real. Like If they turned around and, and put in a bid for Odegaard and they brought him in, I wouldn't be crying. We just we need somebody with that type of quality in that position. If it's Odegaard, then it's Odegaard. If it's James Madison, it's James Madison. I just think with with James Madison, if you paid a little bit more, and the reason why he'd be a little bit more expensive potentially is because he's he's already adapted to the league and all that kind of stuff. And even with Jack Grealish, I think he's the new shiny thing. I think you know he's his name is always kind of out there, and maybe because. James Madison has had this perceived bad season. We're not as high on him. We're like, well, why not just get Jack Grealish? But Madison is a quality quality player. I don't think any of us would say he's not, you know? So, yeah. Next round. You guys ready? Who knows Arsenal? How many times have Arsenal won the, the European tournament? So how many times have we won a European trophy? Essentially. Just one, isn't it? Okay, so Kaya's yeah. going with one. I think... European tournament. So, well. Oh, is that a trick question? Is that a trick question? I mean, there was a European tournament before the now Champions League. So we have maybe won that in our history. <laughs> I, th I, I suspect we've won it once. I'm trying to picture all that, all those like cups lined up. But I also can't remember. Let's go. Uh, right. Just to make it interesting, I'll go with twice. Kai, you can have one. Okay. Or maybe we just haven't. Maybe this is part of Vance. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. It's <laughs> twice in our history, going all the way back. Yeah. What, in the what, old what, format. I mean, bonus what question then, Jess. When did, we, when did we win it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have time to look it up. I'll, I'll look it up later. Cup cup in 94. That's the one I was thinking of, but I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to give, give it away, and then I got it wrong anyway, so... Yep. So for everybody who's like, we've never won a European tournament. <laughs> we have. It was just like a super long time ago. Did I get Fabregas yeah. right, by the way, earlier? I, I, my internet cut out at that exact you moment. The anticipation was killing me. Thank God. Okay, that's good. So, yeah. yeah. But now I want to talk about somebody who looks like is going to be an Arsenal player. I mean, Ben White looks like it's, it's, it's going. Lakanga, though, I like this player. I'm excited about this player. I think for all the maybe um, skepticism and anxiety around Ben White and James Madison being these overly expensive players and maybe us not being smart in the market, bringing in an up and coming, you know, Belgium national team fringe player for 15 to 20 million, whatever, that can step in for Thomas Party when he's not there because they comp really well. That, that signals smart business to me. Kaya, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, the Lokonga deal and how you feel about it? What's your opinion on it? Yeah, so Arsenal were interested in Lokonga, as I'm sure you've seen widely reported everywhere. I think they've made a bid, um, but and I think it was in the region of 18 million euros and elect one closer to 25 million euros, which, you know, back in the old days, that would be a lot of money. But in today's money, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, he's a good player. I, I, I've done a, yeah, a little bit of research into him and I, I spoke at the start about um, a 4-3-3, maybe switching to that. And I just think that if you want a player who can sit deep, receive the ball off the defence and then look forward and play those passes, he's your guy. He's also mobile enough to play in that position, which I think someone like a Granit Xhaka maybe isn't or a Danny Ceballos maybe isn't. So it's a smart move. I don't necessarily think, again, uh, he's someone who's going to start week in, week out straight away just because he's so young and he's not really done it at Premier League level, or sorry, at um, one of the top five leagues yet. So he'd be someone to buy for the future. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it'd be a really smart signing. and it's, it's difficult to be negative like that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, again, like you, you want to see smart deals. You want to see this, you know, signs that the club kind of knows what they're doing. This kind of says that to me. Laura, tell me about all the times that you've watched Lakanga play. Give me your expert opinion on what kind of player this is. And yeah, because clearly 
you've been watching him, haven't you? I was going to say, Jess, you're setting me up for a massive <laughs> failure there. <laughs> I don't know anything about this player. I'm happy to put my hands up and say I, I don't know anything about this player. Everything that I've read suggests, as you as you guys have just said, that it's good business. But I'm not <laughs> going to sit here and be like, yeah, he's a brilliant box box. I don't think anybody's really been watching don't know anything him about like that. Him. Like, just, <laughs> if, everyone needs to stop pretending they're experts on every single player that we're linked to. Just say you don't know and that the experts... <laughs> Watch a couple of compilations. You're an expert. I know. Yeah, just... Log on to YouTube, guys. Someone's already made a Welcome to Arsenal video. Watch that for three minutes, be an expert. But I do agree, though, by the sounds of things, he, he is quite young and it feels like that would be a good kind of like uh, addition to the squad, potentially for the future, that's not going to cost loads of money. So without actually having seen the player, just by the sound of the kind of what he would add as a backup to party, it, it feels like the right kind of move. But as for actually watching him, I look forward to seeing him in an Arsenal shirt so I can actually get, get an idea of how he plays. <laughs> so funny i mean because i don't really want to sit here like i'm so excited about him from what i've seen but i'm not going to act like i've like really seen him play because i really haven't but from everything that i've read similar to what you guys have said yeah like he seems like a good move to me so but okay so i think the only apprehension for arsenal fans may be that we're thinking so if we're spending all this on madison we're going to spend all this on ben white where's the money going to come for the starting central midfield partner for thomas party because you know, if you sell Granite Jaka, you need to bring in somebody that can is a ready-made starter. And that's where, you know, the rumors of like Ruben Neves slash Basuma slash even like maybe us waiting for Camavinga's future to be, you know, set. For, maybe those are, are options for us. You know, Kaya, what is your, your temperature on those three options? And what direction would you like to see Arsenal go in for the partner for Thomas Party? So Camavinga is um, someone who I think is looking less likely just because if you look at the other teams who are interested in him, I think Real Madrid are quite interested in him, PSG are quite interested in him. And we've already spoken about how if it comes down to it, Arsenal aren't going to be able to compete with that. Arsenal struggled to compete with Aston Villa for Emi Buendia earlier in the window. So I don't necessarily think they'll be able to compete with European heavyweights for a player like him, even though he's definitely a great player and he's probably going to be one of the best midfielders in Europe across the next few years. So unfortunately, I think... It seems bizarre to say for someone who's only, uh, I think, 18, 19 years old, but I think Arsenal have missed the boat on that one. Um, on Neves, I think there's a lot more, maybe a realistic possibility that could happen. He seems to be someone who just in terms of uh, profile is more of a Granit Xhaka replacement. Granit Xhaka is very close to moving to Roma. That's going to happen soon enough. And um, the issue with that for me is that maybe they're so similar, you're spending around 35 million on Ruben Neves and Jack is going for around 20 million. Does that make so much sense? I'm not sure he's the upgrade that maybe the 50 million pound net spend suggests, uh, but he's presumed as a player who I really like. And he's someone who is very interested in the move to Arsenal. Uh, his agent is the same agent as Nicola Pepe. Um, he's someone who we saw after the full-time whistle in that final day game against Brighton was having lots of conversations with Pepe. He's also in contact with Gabriel from when they played together at Lille and we know uh, that he's someone who's interested. Arsenal are looking at him but so far there's nothing been nothing formally been done on that front and um, the weight on that sort of given how early Arsenal are going in for their main targets this summer that maybe makes me think that um, maybe they're going to try and look elsewhere. It's, uh, Basuma with is a quite a bit of money 35 million is what reports are suggesting maybe down to 30 million so that's quite a lot. But in terms of a partner for Thomas Partey, I think he'd be fantastic just because he's really good at sitting deep and winning the ball back, which Partey is good at himself. But I think one of the reasons Thomas Partey was lured to Arsenal from Atletico Madrid was because Arsenal offered him the chance to play that sort of box-to-box -box attacking role, which maybe Diego Simeone didn't so much. So I think Basuma will be the guy to sort of unleash that. Maybe Neves could too, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd be more inclined to go to Basuma. I was desperate for that content. Like after the final game, I was I was living for it. I was I was all in it, thinking, yeah, they're talking about where they're where where Basuma's going to move to. He's talking about where his family's going to be sitting in the box. You know, I was I was so trying to make it happen. Like I swear, I was trying to make that happen because personally, I agree with you, Kaya. I think. If Ruben Neves came in, I'm not going to sit here. I think what we do as Arsenal fans is if it's not the person that we want, we tend to go a little bit too hard, like or a little bit too on the opposite spectrum of like the other players. So Basuma is the right choice. 
Neves is the worst thing that ever, ever lived. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's not that he's a quality player. He plays for the Portuguese national team. You don't get on that team in your crap. Let's be real. But I think from, um, do we want to evolve or do we want to just be a better version of what we already are? I think Neves kind of keeps you the same and Basuma evolves your midfield. As you said, it gives you the ability to let Thomas do his thing. And it gives me like Gilberto slash like with Vieira vibes. And I think that's more dynamic and more the type of midfield that we need to be looking at than what we were doing before, you know? So for you, Laura, you know, if we were to bring in like Basuma, Thomas Party, James Madison, what what level of midfield partnership is that for you? Is that top four? I would, I would just say four. I don't know if it, <laughs> I don't know if it's top four because I think one of the things that that we as Arsenal fans are potentially getting carried away with is that we are we are rebuilding, and I think to expect even though on paper that that midfield for me I would absolutely buy your hand off if you op- offer that to me, I still think there are you know we, we're going to need to give it time. So I would say that is the type of midfield that will have us beating the teams that we should beat. I think it will have us giving the big six including ourselves, a, a good run. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. I think, um, I'm just laughing about your consumer comment, it reminds me of the Fabregas one when the Barcelona fans stuck a, stuck a shirt on him, I think after they'd won the Euros. And I was like, that is that is the worst thing I've ever seen because he goes. <laughs> um, but that midfield, I, I agree about a, a kind of light for light replacement for Xhaka. I think that would represent a lack of progress and lack of ambition for me. Just, and I think Ruben Neves is, is too similar to Xhaka in that, in that midfield. And I don't think that is, we've, we've tried and it doesn't work. <laughs> and whether it's the player or how we play, it, it, it doesn't vibe. So a midfield of Partey, Basuma, Madison, I don't know about top four, but for me, that would be a very, very good summer of business for Arsenal. But I mean, it's, it's June guys, it's June. So who knows what could happen? That's very true. We're in the beginning. The only thing is that I do think Arsenal need to be as proactive as they possibly can with a James Madison and a Basuma. Neither of them are in the Euros, So this is a good time to maybe try to get those deals done. And we have to have a good preseason. You know, we have to think about the type of teams or the teams that we're going to be competing with and trying to get into those top spots with. They're going to have almost their entire team out for the Euros, almost the entire team. So they'll be maybe a little bit rocky towards the beginning, you know, when we play Chelsea, when we play Man City. It'd be nice to to nick some points off of those teams because we're ready and they're not, you know. So as much as I'm like, okay, it's June, a lot of things can happen. I would hope that this would signify like these are the targets that we're actually going for. They're more solidified targets, less so than like the the Locatellis and all that kind of stuff that we were being linked with kind of randomly. And we see some solidity, you know, because when you look at other teams, it's like it's obvious who their who their targets are. For a minute, it was like, who are we targeting? Now it seems like we <laughs> were doing something. It was it was really like that. I was like, how how do we like how do we have like twenty people already that we're already linked with, you know? So I would love to see us like kind of solidify our targets. If it takes us till July to get them over the line, that's fine. But I just don't really want to see a bunch of different people being linked because I think that that just sends the wrong message. But that's just me, you know? All right, next round. Let's do it. Who knows Arsenal? So who is Arsenal's record holder for matches played? My inclination is to say Seaman because he's a goalkeeper, but you've tricked me before, so now I'm second-guessing myself. I feel like Tony Adams is, is potentially... In the chat box, if you guys know, go ahead and um, let us know what you Help. think. Yeah. <laughs> Help them. Help us. <laughs> Help us. I agree. Uh, Seaman could, could certainly be that. Yeah, I agree. T- Tony Adams is Mr. Arsenal. So I feel like that that could be that could be it. And, and yeah, there's a chat. Set, as Double Ducky is saying, started young. So I'm, I'm going with Tony Adams. Oh, okay. that's, that's where my gut went. Okay. Um... <laughs> Guy, what are you going with? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go Lee Dixon for no particular reason. Okay, Kai is going Lee Dixon. Laura's going David Zeman. Correct? No, Tony Adams. Tony Adams. Okay, so 
It's David C. Oh, fire, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, no, stick with your first mind. But then oh. I was like, no, let him burn. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but that was a good one. Um, I actually got that one wrong. So there's that. <laughs> so, yeah, but let's um, move forward. I just, for the last kind of section, I do want to talk about the goalkeeper situation, which seems to be on everybody's mind. It's not really making sense. So I'm not able to make it make sense. It feels like, um, you know, Ramsdale is going to be this competitive young English goalkeeper. We're still going to try to get Onana and it's going to be some mix between Onana and Ramsdale when Bern Leno leaves, but we don't know when Bern Leno is leaving. It's very confusing. So Kaya, what's your temperature on the goalkeeper situation? And, and Ramsdale in particular, are we actually really in for him? I mean, it's that's 20 million for for him seems a little bit much. So I'll answer the Inanna one first, and then I'll go on to Ramsdale, if that's okay. The Inanna one, um, the fact that his drug span got reduced basically means that Arsenal are very interested, and I think they're, they're looking to get that done as soon as possible. There's, there are other teams interested, which might make it a bit difficult, but he's a really good goalkeeper and available for quite a, a small price because he's only got one year left in his contract and obviously can't play for quite a while. I think he's able to train in September now and play in November. So I think that would be what Arsenal were trying to go for. Matt Ryan is obviously a goalie who they had last uh, season for half a season on loan, but that's not looking like it's going to happen anymore, unfortunately, just because Arsenal can't offer him the first team football that other teams can, even though he's really well liked at Arsenal. And I think um, a lot of Arsenal fans really warmed to him when he first came in and was saying, I'm a boyhood Arsenal fan. This is my dream, that kind of stuff. So I think it'd be great if Arsenal could get him back on loan, but it's not looking like it's going to happen. Bernd Leno is a bit of a strange one because he's not looking to commit to Arsenal. Uh, he's only got two years left on his deal. So that means Arsenal are in a position where they basically need to try and sell him if they want to get a decent price for him. So maybe that means he's going to go this summer. But the problem is I've not seen that many teams interested in him. The only team I've seen interested in him or linked with him at least are Borussia Dortmund, uh, which would make sense because they probably do need a better goalkeeper. But um, whether they can afford what Arsenal would likely ask for, I'm not sure. And then coming on to Ramsdale, the thing that is probably in his favour, I think Arsenal are interested in Aaron Ramsdale. That's what uh, I've heard. So that's a sign, I guess, that they're looking to get someone who's homegrown in that second goalkeeper spot. Obviously, Arsenal really struggled with their quota of homegrown, homegrown players um, uh, last season, which is why Ozil and um, Socrates were left out of the squad earlier on. So... If Arsenal can get a homegrown backup goalkeeper, that's what they'll do. That's why they were tracking Freddie Woodman at Swansea or Newcastle. He was on loan at Swansea. And it's why they were tracking David Raya at Brentford because he technically counts as homegrown. So if they can get an English goalkeeper in as backup, that's what they'll look to do, even though it does seem kind of strange to spend 20 million on your backup goalkeeper and then I think uh, 7 million on your first choice goalkeeper. But that sort of maybe explains why um, Arsenal are so keen to bring in a player like Aaron Ramsdale. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the price is, is shocking. And I think we're trying to, again, I think we're doing that thing where we're going a little bit too far. There's people that are saying that Ramsdale is literally the worst thing. He's the worst goalkeeper. He's not worse than Renarsson. You guys, we've seen Renarsson. We've seen him. <laughs> we've seen him. We know he's not worse. So for me, it's just, it's the fee. And I asked, you know, on Twitter, if, we had to pay 20 for Onana and we paid like seven for Ramsdale. Would that make a difference? And a lot of people said yes. So it's not the fact that we're spending money on a goalkeeper. It's the fact that we're spending 20 million on Ramsdale or we want to. So I guess I kind of think like, I mean, if that's what you guys are going to do, that's what you guys are going to do. It's not the first time that I've seen you guys do some silly stuff, you know, but at the same time, it just doesn't, the optics are not great on it because it's just like, well, why couldn't we find a cheaper backup goalkeeper? But this just kind of leads me into like feeling like Arsenal want to do something different with their goalkeepers. I've kind of been getting this sense that they want to have a more competitive goalkeeper situation. They don't want it to be just like number one. And then the second is almost unusable. And I've never really seen that before, except for at Manchester United where they had De Gea kind of fighting with Dean Henderson. I'm not sure how that works. But Laura, how do you feel about the goalkeeper situation? I mean, Leno, good goalkeeper. If he wants to leave, then you move him on. But Onana, super cheap. 
you know, would be a good person to bring in, but do we actually need to be spending this type of money on Ramsdale? I feel like Arsenal have got away with a really weird and really bad goalkeeping situation for quite a few years. I think it's an area where we've kind of just accepted that we're going to have something you know, mediocre between the sticks. And I'm not saying that Bernardo is mediocre, but I do think we've gone from Czech and then we went through a situation with Leno. Obviously, we then sold Emmy, and I know that Twitter get up in arms about us selling Emmy, but guys, he wanted to go. He wanted to be at the first team goalkeeper and he's done just that. So I think we need to let that go. I agree. I don't, I don't really get how that works in practice, having two or three goalkeepers continually fight for that top spot. Maybe it maybe it could work, um, and that I feel like is, you know, could be really good. I, I personally would find that unsettling um, to, to kind of have a constant question mark over who's who's in goal. The the fees are nuts, and I think again that's going to get Arsenal Twitter up in arms about spending twenty million on a goalkeeper. Um, but I do think it's an area that we've kind of just sort of accepted a bit of mediocrity over the years, and I think it has cost us Leno. I think has been inconsistent. I think at times he's been brilliant, but certainly is not the kind of rock that we we need. And it's not a glamorous position, but it's the type of position that is, you know, not helping us in our bid for top six, top four. You think about how many points that we, we've lost because of that. So I actually, if we're going to have to spend the money to get a quality goalkeeper, I think it's a, a sensible, it's sensible business. I just don't understand how, where 20 million has come from. That seems excessive to me. Well, we know how Sheffield is, right? We, we see how they are with Burge. You know, they yeah. want to make sure that they get money for these guys, like even though they're going down, you know. So I think it's not I, 20 million to me seems when I looked at his, his transfer market value, it was about 17 last season when he was playing for Bournemouth. And then it dropped down to 13 when he played for Sheffield. Doesn't help your cause when you're playing for relegation sides. If we apply the same type of thinking that we would to a Ben White or a James Madison, this is a player that's been in and around. Was he not just called up to the English national team because Dean Henderson yeah. dropped yeah. or he he was out? So we're talking about another player in the English national team. Whether he's going to play or not, we know that that adds a little bit of tax. Being British <laughs> adds more tax. So and being young adds tax. You know, so twenty million when your value is about thirteen seems like that's probably where Sheffield is going with it. So when I'm trying to make it make sense from a, a fee standpoint, you know, and Arsenal fans were so funny. We're so funny. We don't want to spend money on other people's players, but we want people to spend, give us 30 million for Granite Xhaka, give us 40 for Willick. I mean, there that's just the fee. Now, whether we should be in for Ramsdale, it is what it is. For me, I think where I stand in the window, and this is I'm consistent with this, is as long as we get the midfielders, the creative midfielder, the center midfielder, and the backup center midfielder, I'm Gucci. Like, I'm Gucci. As long as they work. Like, as long as they're the right profile. Now, if we're sitting there with Ben White and Ramsdale at the end of the window, and that's it, then, yeah, I'm mad. Like, yeah, I'm mad. You know, but I don't think getting these players necessarily means that we're not going to get the others, you know, so comma, comma, let's just see how it, how it works out. You know, I just, I want everybody just, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause for me, if you told, if, if you told me right now that we would have James Madison, a Basuma type player, Lakonga, Ben White, and two new goalkeepers, I'm not asking you how much it costs. It's not my money. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. I mean, what do you guys kind of think about just to kind of finish up on the transfer talk about, Arsenal fans being such accountants and stress, you know, stressed out people during the transfer window when really we just, I feel like we need to focus more on profile and does this work for us versus like how much money these players cost? Kai, what do you think? Um, I'm, I'm wary of criticizing the Arsenal fan base on mass, but uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd say there's, I, I get the the worries just insofar as they're, they're looking out for the long-term interest of the club. So that's what they're worried about. And there's that mistrust between Arsenal and Stan Kroenke, which has existed for years, but has only been exacerbated by the whole Super League fiasco. So that's where that comes from. And also all the information coming out of the club has been Arsenal have no money. Uh, they've taken out the £120 million loan from the Bank of England. They've got to pay fines for being in the European Super League. They've had no fans at the Emirates this season. So all of that seems to dictate that Arsenal don't have that much money. So when you're talking about spending £20 million on someone like Aaron Ramsdale, who maybe they don't necessarily need within the squad. I guess that's why um, 
that's why people are so sort of um, worried about uh, the, the finances at the minute. I mean, I see like little like, you know, people with their little notes and they like screenshot it and put it on Twitter. Like if we sell this player, this player and this player and bring in this player, get this player for a free, make sure we do this, maybe offer him to Brighton so we could get. I mean, it just feels so like I feel like we're putting a lot of unneeded stress on ourselves, you know, <laughs> or what do you think about what do you I think just, about I just I just want to be like, guys, there is an international football tournament on for you to enjoy, okay? Just step, <laughs> step away from Arsenal for a bit. There are very few Arsenal players at the tournament. Enjoy the football without with that, knowing that, that Arsenal can't ruin it for you. I, I do get, though, what Kai just said around... It, it's like a there are so many things that are causing the angst amongst, amongst Arsenal fans. The one thing I, I would add, which I know people are not going to like, but where we have fallen away from the top six, we have not adjusted our expectations around players. So while we are, you know, while we are struggling in the Premier League, you have to then downgrade your expectations around why players would sign from clubs like Leicester. They, you know, are offering more, they're offering European football. And I think hanging on to this, well, obviously they'll want to come to Arsenal. There, there is a massive gap now between, I think, what Arsenal fans expect from the transfer window. That's not to say that we can't sign brilliant players, but I think there is a there is a huge amount of delusion amongst Arsenal fans, myself included, on who we can <laughs> sign and who the club can afford and the types of players that want to come to Arsenal. But I just think, yeah, leave, shut down the Excel spreadsheets, just live your life guys some of you are choosing misery and i feel like what what will be what will be and there will be a team lining up in august for us to to get behind don't stress about street fee structures and things live your lives guys <laughs> i literally see like schedules of payments it's so yeah. funny um but yeah before we get to the last question kaya can you answer a question for tejas he asked yeah. Um, where do you think the likes of Ballard, McGuinness, and Reckick Futures lie? They're young centre backs. You know, yeah. So Daniel Ballard is going out on loan next season. They're going to try and find a championship club for him to to play for. He did really well at Blackpool in League One last season, so they're hoping to to get him a championship team. Uh, Mark McGuinness, I, I actually had the pleasure of doing an interview with him. He's a really down to earth guy. He's got his head screwed on quite straight, and he's very clear that if he can't make it in the first team at Arsenal, he's looking to get first team football somewhere else so no matter where that is he's, he's willing to go for it so I'd assume there'll be another loan uh Karim Rekic is potentially someone who they'll be looking to loan out as well we're not 100% sure on that myself and Chris Wheatley at football loan, we've, we've actually been looking into that that's one of the things we've been talking about over the past few days is trying to look into that one what I would say is um Per Mertesacker who's in charge of the academy these days is his new policy from last season seems to be that he wants to loan these young players out uh, who are in the under-23s to try and boost their value, which I think is pretty smart with what we've seen Chelsea do um, in the past. And it's really worked out well for them in terms of raising transfer revenues. So maybe that's something um, Arsenal are looking to do with loaning out young defenders uh, like those three mentioned there. Yeah, 100%. I think it's good to see young players and th there to be some sort of like plan with the academy and to bring in players and increase their value and stuff. So those are always good things for, for Arsenal. And so I do want to do the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the youngest goal scorer in Arsenal's Premier League history? Well, I thought it was Theo Walcott, but obviously not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly not. Uh, <laughs> I want to say Jack Wilshire. You're going to go with Jack? Okay, I'm, I'm leaning towards the Ox, I think. All right. It's Serge. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This has, not been, this has not been successful. We do not know Arsenal. No. So much fun. <laughs> I mean, the fact that, like, all of us are kind of getting it wrong, like, you know, should say that these are difficult really questions. Sure, right? You know, these are difficult questions. So... Yeah, for sure, you guys. I think this is a really good show. Laid back transfer discussion. Not a lot of like, oh my gosh, what's happening? You know, like more just like chill. <laughs> so yeah, Kaya, can you let everybody know where they can find you on the internet? Yeah, um, I've mentioned it a few times, but football.london is who I work for. Um, so on their website, on their Twitter handles, which I believe are at ArsenalFL and at football underscore LDN, and then I'm on Twitter as well at Kaya Kana at 97, and I've got a Facebook page which you guys are more than welcome to check out 
uh, where I post all my stuff. Perfect. Laura, where can they find you on the internet? Um, so I'm at Laura Kirk 12 on Twitter. I'm trying to, as much as I can, just let Twitter brush over me at the moment because there's Arsenal are just moving mad, but that is where you can find me if you need me. <laughs> Perfect. You guys, I'll be back at 10 p.m. UK time with George. I'm not quite sure what we're going to talk about. We usually just get on here and do whatever, you know, so me and George will be back on at 10 p.m. UK time. So make sure you guys are here, right here, and you guys can like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye, guys. Thank <laughs> you.